organizers for inviting me. Um, these have been great talks. It's really nice to see that physiology is alive and well and we're listening to it. I think that's why I'm happy working after all these years. Uh, being an intensivist is working in an environment of a, basically a living laboratory and I keep thinking about my physiology with every patient. Um, so, I hope I don't disappoint. Those were three great talks. So mine is Venus return during mechanical ventilation. I have no conflicts of interest. So the fundamental principle that I begin with is the heart controls cardiac output by regulating right atrial pressure and not by controlling the arterial pressure. It controls what comes back. And the simple conceptual model that I like using is the, com the, the, co the uh, comment that our vasculature is like a large bathtub. It's a large reservoir, reservoir of volume, volume. And the way we get blood back is the heart lowers the right atrial pressure, allows that reservoir to drain, and then we put it back again. So the veins, stre the stretch of the veins is the force that pushes blood back to the heart, and the heart has a permissive function. It allows that blood to come back, and of course it's restorative, because if you do not put it back in the bathtub, you won't have any more flow. So it has to put it back again. The fundamental concept is that the heart only can pump out what comes back to it. So Arthur Guyton studied this well, and he provided this powerful graphical tool to, out, to understand the interaction of that pump function, the heart, with that bathtub return function. So when the pressure in the right atrium is equal to the pressure upstream in the bathtub, the flow is zero. And we call that pressure the mean systemic filling pressure, the pressure filling the veins upstream from the heart. And as I said, the job of the heart is to lower right atrial pressure. So the lower the right atrial pressure relative to the bathtub, the more it comes back to a plateau, which I'll get to in a moment. So the x-intercept is that mean systemic filling pressure. It's the pressure filling that vasculature. And since the veins are very compliant, the bulk of the volume is in that bathtub region, and that pressure generally changes very little during the cycle. And it drains through a resistance and it comes out with this funny one over just because we're lowering the downstream rather than raising an upstream. So that was the return function. All of you are very aware of the cardiac function, the Starling relationship, and they have the same axes. So we can put them together and we have the working central venous pressure, the working cardiac output, and the working venous return. And it's the interaction of these two functions that determines what's coming out of the heart at the end. So now there's, very two, two, there's two very important limits. There's a limit to how much comes back with this plateau, and there's a limit on the cardiac function side that limits how much can go out. Importantly, as we breathe spontaneously, the function curve starts at a negative value. It's inside the thorax, at, uh, at uh, end of expiration at FRC, the balance of forces is such that the pressure around the heart is a negative number, so we start the cardiac function curve from a value below atmosphere. Remember, it's below atmosphere. That means it's not really below zero, it's just below our reference, which is atmosphere. Now, looking at that limit to venous return, so if the heart is functioning, or more commonly, if you have somebody on an ECMO or mechanical pump at cardiac surgery, and you really suck on the system, once the pressure outside the great vessels is less than the inside pressure, you get vascular collapse and this limit to venous return. So it's the concept of a vascular waterfall. And when that happens, lowering right atrial pressure further does not increase any venous return. And any of you that have worked with ECMO, you know that if the pump is turned up too much, you get a chatter in the tubes. And when that happens, you reach this maximum venous return. So the best the heart can do when breathing spontaneously is lower the right atrial pressure to zero. So the maximum possible return to the circuit is the pressure upstream, the mean systemic filling pressure, divided by the resistance between them. And after that, you cannot get more flow. Or if you want to think of a gross example, think of the Aztec model where they used to sacrifice humans, they ripped the heart out of the body, 
at that moment, they would have their maximum possible flow in the system, but clearly it wouldn't last very long. So when you are limited, the only way you can get more flow is you need to increase mean systemic filling pressure. And you do that by adding volume in one way or the other. So you are dependent on that volume to get to a higher value. So how do changes in pleural pressure change cardiac output? So we're going to look on the positive side with mechanical breaths. So every time you breathe in with a, with a device, you're raising the pleural pressure. You started off at that negative value, but if you just applied PEEP, you would shift the cardiac function curve to the right. So now you intersect the venous return curve at a higher value and have a lower output with a, um, with a higher right atrial pressure or central venous pressure. And then when you breathe on that, for each breath, you're going higher on each breath. And on each inspiration, you're lowering the return to the heart further. So there's a decrease in cardiac output when you apply positive pressure, and with each breath, it becomes worse. So what happens when the return curve intersects, uh, sorry, when the cardiac function curve uh, intersects the return curve when you're on the flat part of the cardiac function curve. In that case, you actually can apply PEEP and you can raise the pressure without a change in right atrial pressure and without a change in cardiac output. But when you do that, you actually lower the transmural pressure in the heart, so you actually decompress the wall of the heart. So the transmural pressure is reduced and you have less what I call wasted preload. However, if you raise it further, you'll reach a point where, again, you decrease cardiac output. So that means that when you're ventilating patients, you do not always decrease cardiac output. If your volume filled and you're on the flat part, you will not, but eventually you will. Now, a second very important uh, component of raising pleural pressure is that it also changes that collapse pressure, that vascular waterfall. So now it occurs at a higher value, which means your maximum cardiac output is reduced when that happens. And this is some data from Hank Fessler many years ago just demonstrating this collapse point in animals. This is the SVC and this is the IVC, just demonstrating that actual phenomenon that it really occurs. So why are changes in right atrial pressure or CVP so important? because the gradient for venous return is very small. Here's an example on a subject that person came back from cardiac surgery. They were paced. You can't see the pacer marks here, but they're paced. The pacer is stopped at this point and waiting for to see if there's an escape beat. There was one escape beat, but just one. So we started off with a pressure of six millimeters of mercury in the CVP. At the end, it was 10, so that this at uh, this time, you really should be at the mean systemic filling pressure. In 12 to 15 seconds, you're pretty well have equilibrated with the upstream pressure. So the gradient is only 4 millimeters of mercury. And this is very typical. And the number of studies, it's 4 to 6 is the number of the gradient from the mean systemic filling pressure back to the right atrium. It's a very small number, but your total five liters of cardiac output goes through that four to six millimeters of mercury. So small changes make a very big difference. So how can you maintain cardiac output when you apply PEEP? So here would be a schematic cartoon where the pleural pressure is increased and the heart is shifted to the right with positive pressure and you can see the dramatic fall that you're going to have in cardiac output. Just think about it. If the gradient is six millimeters of mercury, six, I'm being generous, and you dropped it by three, you, you were, sorry, raised the, pl the pleural pressure by three, you cut cardiac output in half. So how do you do that? Well, you give volume as a clinician, or your body's reflexes can recruit unstressed volume into stressed volume. And that will shift the venous return curve to the right and help restore cardiac output. So this was a study we did years ago looking at this in animals. Yes, animals are useful uh, for these studies. This is schematically showing with the, the increase in PEEP, which you would expect is this decrease in cardiac output. But 
What we also found is that the vessels tightened up and unstressed volume is converted into stress volume. So you can see how this, the pressure volume curves of the body shift to the left. And by doing that, then the venous return curve has shifted and you can maintain cardiac output. Not quite the same. You can see there was a drop. And these are from the actual numbers in the study. And these are schematic pictures of what would happen. So you can restore it. So, what's the consequences of positive pressure for venous return? So mean, mean systemic filling pressure must be higher to maintain venous return. As I already stated, the normal gradient is four, six millimeters of mercury. But think of the meaning of that. If you start off with a central venous pressure of 10 millimeters of mercury relative to atmosphere, the mean systemic filling pressure, if the difference was six, would be 16. The gradient from mean systemic filling pressure to the venous capillary pressure is about 10. So now you're up to 26 at the low end of the capillaries. And there's a 10 millimeter gradient to the arterial side of the capillaries. You're up to 36 millimeters of mercury. You are going to be filtering. Now, if you look at the example I showed here, and this was the actual data in that study, the mean systemic filling pressure was close to 20. In that case, the capillary pressures would have been 46 millimeters of mercury. Guess what? Your patients leak when you have these high values. We are not made to be ventilated, is really the conclusion. And it's important when you're taking off the PEEP. So you, you uh, uh, maintain yourself by contracting on stress volume or by the clinician giving volume to try to get an adequate output. Oh, you noted the patient was volume sensitive, so you, volume responsive, so you gave them volume. But now, when you take off that PEEP, that curve shifts backwards, and you're now at that higher value. If you have a good heart, that's fine. But if your heart's not good, then you've overloaded it. And I didn't put in that wonderful diagram from the Francois Le Maire that shows how the patient's wedges went dramatically elevated. Now, an important point, of course, is that the right heart can only, left heart can only pump out what the right heart gives it. They're in series. Um, so, oh, God. Uh, so this was a, a mathematical model we used to, uh, with a Simulink, to actually model heart-lung interactions and specifically look at the effects of a change in pleural pressure and a change in um, uh, the load on the right ventricle, uh, the West zones two and three. But I'm only going to show the plural part today. So this is just mathematically modeling these, but it just shows you the changes that occur. So on the top is pulmonary artery pressure, on the left side arterial pressure, and with the model I can do pressure volume loops of the two sides. And the point I want to emphasize, well this is with 10 mil 20 millimeters of uh, uh, plural pressure, the, cardiac the stroke volume and the pressure volume loop practically disappears. It goes to nothing during the cycle. Look at the marked fall on the pulmonary pressure. Now you don't see the same on the left side because you have a volume reserve in your pulmonary veins that can continue filling. You see the pulse uh, fluctuation, but you don't get this drop. And this can cause a marked fluctuation in the flow through the capillaries. That's why I loved hearing your talk, because you talked about the shear stress on the walls, but there's a dramatic change in the flow through the capillaries because you're cycling from almost no flow to high flow during these high cycling, uh, high cycling parts. So I think there really is a vascular injury as well, potentially from endothelial damage with these changes in shear force, which would be truly dramatic. Oop. Okay, so the pulmonary buffering, uh, the volume in the pulmonary vessel, vessels are enough to maintain it. Um, okay, so that's the volume in this area. So what about that limit to the cardiac function curve? There is that sharp plateau. Where is that coming from? This is a paper uh, that we that, I public, we that my group published uh, just last year. We call it right ventricular limitation in a tail of two elastances. So the concept of RV limitation, I think, is a crucial concept for us to keep in mind. Because the right ventricle, even though we don't think about it, it determines the stroke volume. The left side can only pump out what the right side gives it. So if you're looking at a decrease in stroke volume, it has to start at the right side. 
So this is looking at the pressure volume relationship of the right ventricle. As you all know, there's a passive filling curve. And on the right side, it has a very sharp break. That's the diastolic elastance. And then there's the end systolic elastance, the concept of uh, Sagawa, the time varying elastance of the ventricle. So this is the maximum pressure that the ventricle can form for any given volume. And the stroke volume has to be caught between these two lines. It's simple geometry. So that's the systolic alliance, elastance. A typical um, elastance of the right ventricle would be in the range of around one millimeter of mercury. That should be per ml, per ml got lost. On the left side, it's three to four. So a typical uh, pulmonary artery on this scale uh, would be opening pressure around 15 millimeters of mercury. Um, systolic pressures maybe around 20. And that would be a typical stroke volume on the right side with 70 mLs. Lots of room to use diastolic reserves and to go up. But whenever you change the opening pressure of the right ventricle, which essentially is diastolic pressure, that reduces the maximum possible stroke volume. Because if you open at any higher number, you have less distance before you reach that end systolic elastance line. And that limits the maximum stroke volume you can have from the right ventricle, and therefore the maximum you can have from the right ventricle. So this is with the normal elastance. And if you could see, if you, if you were opening at uh, 100 millimeters of mercury, you would have, in this case, a stroke volume of only 40 mLs. Also, you notice they're not stopping at the uh, actual end, 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 end diastolic elastance curve. They're actually stopping before. And I didn't really appreciate it myself until I was playing with these, because this point here assumes that the mean systemic filling pressure was 10. So clearly, you can have a higher diastolic pressure in the ventricle, because if the upstream is 10, you can't be higher. So that value also sets what the final value you're going to have. And this value here determines where you hit that line. So this geometry uh, definitely fixes where we are. And notice, too, that if you added volume and you gain this a little bit, you gain a trivial change in stroke volume on this part. Now, if your right ventricle is depressed, and now I've made the end, uh, end, end systolic elastance curve 0.5, you can see that maximum stroke volume is dramatically less, and you are really compromised. So what this tells you that is the greater the PA diastolic pressure, not the peak, the diastolic pressure, the lower the maximum stroke volume. And if your end systolic elastance is lower, then it's even more punitive. So you're fine with a non-functioning right ventricle. Um, you're fine if your right ventricle is working well. But if you have a decreased ventricular function, increased PA pressures are much more harmful. So in summary, mechanical ventilation always requires a high CVP for the same stroke volume because it's the transmural that counts. This means that mean systemic filling pressure and capillary pressures must also be higher in the, um, sorry, that should be ventilated patient. Venous return is determined by CVP relative to atmosphere, but cardiac output is determined by the transmural CVP but the tissues are affected by the pressure relative to atmosphere. So the transmural pressure is always lower in the mechanically ventilated patient than the CVP that you see on the monitor. And RV limitation determines that maximum stroke volume. No, didn't want that. <laughs> okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Sheldon. Uh, Questions or comments from the audience? Yeah. Thank you very much, Shelley, for the wonderful lecture. It has been said that um, the increase in right atrial pressure that tends to decrease venous return was compensated by an increase in mean systemic pressure due to the thoracic thoracoabdominal transmission during mechanical ventilation. I mean the increase in abdominal pressure that tends to decrease the phenomenon you showed. Would you agree with that? Uh, it can. It gets complicated, though, because the abdominal pressure can also get, get 
can get transmitted to the pleural space, and then if it raises pleural pressure, then you lose it. So I may show these figures tomorrow. So you can get both. It depends upon the balance and how much and the volume. So it's quite variable. But generally, it's not going to be that productive. But the bigger point is that limit. So the way I look at it, I mean, actually, I just published a paper recently on Fontan physiology. Fontan is when you don't have a right ventricle. And as you, uh, I mean, Fontan, I exercised a patient with a Fontan heart, uh, so no right ventricle, and he got to 85% of his predicted VO2 uh, in his younger days. They get worse later on. So you can do fine without an RV if you don't raise the PVR. And once you raise the PVR, then it's totally different. So in that range where the PVR is low, you're okay. But once it starts to go up and you raise PA pressures, you need that right ventricle to work to get that volume up. So thank you very much for touching briefly on ECMO. Um, so I, I saw very well that you that you started uh, to, to reduce the heart to a vascular and a cardiac function curve, and luckily you, you turned to uh, the right left ventricular interaction, but you touched briefly on ECMO. My question would be, how would you translate this concept into the question how we should interpret the concept of fluid responsiveness to VA ECMO, since that makes things a bit more complicated. Yeah. If, you, or VA? if you, in VA ECMO, yeah. would consider heart lung interaction and the effect of PEEP, so how would that translate into how we should avoid chattering and... Well, um, VA ECMO, you're ignoring the heart. It's, you've gone around it. So, and then your machine is just totally... Then, if it's... The problem is if your pump is pumping it out faster than it's coming back, you have inadequate flows. And, of course, the pumps have limits. That's why we get up to four, three and a half, four, or any mechanical device, the same thing. You get limited by them. And then the problem in those patients, you're fine as long as you haven't lost your, SV, your systemic vascular resistance. But when they get septic, you can't manage them. You can't get it back fast enough. They become impossible to manage. I think the, the pumps intri- won't go higher, and you can't maintain the pressure. The intriguing question is, of course, that we have two closed-loop systems that drain on the same right atrium, and probably the mean systemic filling pressure is effectively a very comparable in both situations. Yeah, but I'm, but I'm saying though, I'm saying the problem. I mean, I've run into this problem. If once they're if somebody's got a low SVR and they're septic, and they need a cardiac output of seven, you can't do it. You can't do it. And then you have ridiculous doses of vasopressors to support them. Um, and then you, then you need a true mechanical device, an LVAN, to actually do it. 